will learn a whole new perspective on Rails engines, a much lighter and leaner way to use them uh, that allows teams to break up their app into meaningful modules without losing the beauty of Rails conventions. Sprinkle in the Packwerk gem by Shopify for the perfect combo to scale your domain and your team. Our next speaker, Julian, is a musician, audio engineer, self-taught software engineer, and a Ruby lover. Surely he's into pairing. Wow, talking to Julian last night, he is all in on pairing when he needs to learn new code base or a new language like he's learning Kotlin. But after that... Well, after that, he's just way into soloing all the things, free from the shackles of pairing. For such an anti-pairing guy, we are lucky to have him tonight uh, to pause and share with his know-how on compartmentalizing the monolith. Please welcome Julian Pinzon in Slava. All you need is Rails engines compartmentalizing your monolith. That was great. I have been a musician my whole life. I even went to school for it. Oops, this is the wrong stuff. Thank you very much. I went, went to school for music and audio engineering. I had always been interested in computers, though, so through the twists and turns of life, I ended up teaching myself how to code with my best friend. But I struggled quite a bit. After decades of being a musician, my mind was simply not wired like the mind of the software engineers I was competing against at job interviews. Um, to this day, it still isn't. But what I did know was how to write songs and write music, how to write to simplify, com simplify complex feelings and put them into the world. After some time, I found out that one of my strengths as a software engineer and a differentiator as a software engineer was that, the design aspect of it, the design of beautiful experiences in code. Just like I, I had spent countless hours searching for the right ways to express a feeling, the right metaphors. Now I find joy in taking the time to find the right name for an abstraction or to refactor code so that anyone in any level can actually read it and understand it, so that I, with my artistic wired brain, can understand it. After years of studying Rails and working with it in several companies, I reached a point where I was very comfortable writing stuff and building stuff with it. But those products grew and I started struggling with maintaining that simplicity that I worked towards every day. My cherished rail conventions, the ones that, I had, that had helped me so much in the beginning, seemed to start working against me, or actually me against them. So I challenged myself to find a solution for that, to reignite my belief in creating beautiful code in rails, beautiful systems that are a joy to work in, regardless of their scale. And I happened to find the answer in rails itself. Welcome to All You Need Is Rails Engines, modularizing your monolith using Rails engines and Packwork, a talk by me, Julian Pinzon Eslava. You can find me everywhere as Pinzon Julian. I come from the beautiful city of Bogota, Colombia, in South America. This is a photo of Bogota, and it's 2,600 meters uh, up in the Andes Mountains. But there's something even better than the view, and that's Arepas. Arepas are these absolutely delicious corn-based flatbread things that are just delicious. These are the ones we have probably at breakfast or at a break uh, with a little butter and maybe a hot chocolate on the side. We have these that are made of, out of sweet corn filled with cheese. They're amazing. Uh, these, are, these ones are called arepe huevos. They are double fried and they have an egg inside them. So you fry them once, put an egg, then refry them. It's, it's amazing. It's double fried. What Things are not good if they're double fried. That's. <laughs> and finally, these ones uh, that are called Arepas Santanderianas from the Santander region in Colombia, they're great because they have pork rind in the dough. So they're like so savory. They're so good. There's a place nearby where you can get some arepas if you're interested. Just hit me up. Uh, whoa. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about um, what, uh, the app that we're going to build today in this talk. It's going to be a, 
uh, hypothetical music universe app that helps teachers organize and plan music uh, lessons for their students, maybe send billing reminders, etc. It's my idea though, so don't go building it yourselves and don't go forking this repo that you see over there and starting it and just analyzing uh, it. So please don't do it. <laughs> Uh, the, the, feel, the beautiful feeling of a new Rails app, like you just run the Rails new command and uh, it's, it's so good. You can almost feel the smell of fresh cookies coming out of your computer. <laughs> you start coding and building stuff, for example, for your users to authenticate. So you decide to organize that code inside of an authentication module. And as time passes by, you start adding more and more models and controllers and views and jobs and you're organized, so you're, you use modules to tell the reader this is its own unit and it's related to everything that shares the same module. But these modules tend to be like um, in different folders all around your code base. But you start to have good problems. Your app is doing well. You have gained traction and your teachers love your product and they're struggling to retain, uh, and you're struggling to retain them because kids nowadays are all about apps. And your initial idea was to send emails for homework. Like, who uses email these days? Everything is apps. Everything's notifications. So they're struggling with that, and they are begging you to create an app for your students. And you know it in your gut that it's a good idea. So you start building that. And suddenly, you go from the monolith you love to the monolith you'll probably hate in a few months or a few years. By adding a new namespace that is not quite like the others, you sign the agreement to carry a huge debt. This new module models a new actor in your system. Not a new role, but a new actor altogether. It's a top-level module, so it'll be put alongside all of your other top-level modules. So in this example, maybe billing is right alongside your new student app. They don't seem to match. I have encountered this problem in Rails apps many, many times, and wondered for years if there was a way to make the code base speak for itself and show me the boundaries. How do you design stuff that speak for itself? I'm going to take a quick detour and talk about Norman Doors. Has anyone heard about Norman Doors here? Oh, very little people. That's so good. Cool. So this is a Norman Door. Every time I run into a door, I make like this quick analysis. Is, is it a Norman Door or not? So have you ever approached a door and pushed it, and it doesn't open? So you push a little bit harder, and it doesn't budge. So you're looking anguished to see if anyone is actually looking at you struggle with the door. And then you think, okay, maybe I need to pull it. And then you pull it, and it opens. And you feel like a fool. Like, I do that all the time. <laughs> Especially with the ones that have a huge sign that someone printed that says pull, or then it's handwritten. Well, I'm here to tell you it's not your fault. It's the design of the door. The problem is the choice of door handles. With a door like this, how do you know what to do? How do you know when to push and when to pull? A properly designed door will speak for itself and will prompt you to do the most obvious action, plate for push and a handle for pull. I care deeply about the experience of a code base, the design of the code base itself, how you navigate it. That's why there's a Rails app that I love, a small Rails app, an app that is kept in check by the conventions of the framework. It makes most thing, things obvious, and it always feels very familiar, even if it's, a, if it's the first time you see it. And I think that's at the crux of the age-old meme, Rails doesn't scale. It's no longer about scaling resources. We can put our code in more power, powerful server, servers and put them in multiple servers and balance the load. We, have, we can even have multiple databases and shard them. We have beautiful and conventional caching mechanisms. So I guess the problem comes from the volume of code in our apps and how that becomes a problem to scale. Not just our domains, but our teams around it. The beauty and the speed of Rails conventions, again, start working against us. The only advice here seems to be extract your code into microservices and get rid of the monolith. But the jump in complexity is astronomical. So I wondered, how can I turn the Rails monolith I hate into many small Rails apps that I love, but keeping it simple? So I started searching for an answer. I put on my designer hat and came up with this. Could we have something that resembles two or more separate apps within the same monolith, each app with its own models and views and controllers and tests. Or pushing it further, even something like this, where a single app is composed of many different areas, and each of these areas have their own models and controllers and jobs. How would you go about doing something like this in Rails when you just have a single app folder? Here's what I've seen so far. 
You can have any structure in the app folder. It doesn't have to follow the traditional Rails structure. But let's say you add a features folder inside of app. And then within that folder, you create directories for models and controllers. Your classes will have, will have modules for models and controllers because of the side work autoloading mechanism. So you will have maybe to override the table name because you don't want the table name to have the models word in it. Sure, you can tell Sidework to collapse the model folder, but then your structure becomes unconventional. Here's another option. You can, you can actually ditch all of Rails conventions of having models, uh, uh, folders for modules and controllers and jobs. And you can actually make your own structure as you please, and it'll work, as long as you respect Sidework's loading conventions. You'll have a problem with views, though. You'll have to tell Rails to look for views elsewhere in your application. This works. But what I don't like about this is that it no longer feels like a Ruby on Rails application. And there's a lot of power in the tribal knowledge of how a Rails app is structured. You can go from company to company, from project to project, and feel like at home every, every time. So what about Rails engines? I don't know if you've read these articles, but Shopify has been saying for a long time that Rails engines are the answer. So I figured I'd try. So I went to the Rails guide, I purchased a few books, I read every possible article and embarked on the journey of creating my dream app structure using engines. Here's how it went. In a completely new, fresh app, I run uh, this, the generator that's in the Rails guides. And I quickly saw that it creates a Git repository when you create it. So I don't want to have two Git repositories for my app. So that didn't work. So OK, there's an, a flag to skip Git. So that's good. I'm going to skip Git. And I got this. It actually kind of resembles what I was talking about, like an, an app structure that, have asset, that has assets, models, controllers, jobs. It kind of resembles what I want. So I went and tried and do a commit. And there were 80 files that were created when I ran the generator. Where does this come from? Well, the generator assumes that you're going to publish your engine and then it is going to be completely generic, and it'll be installed in any Rails application anywhere in the world. So logically, you'll have to test it against some sort of dummy application, which is in itself a complete Rails application with models and controllers, and jobs, and mailers. And then you'll have a gem spec and a gem file, and a gem file because it's actually a gem. So, and also, engines will have active record models, and they will need their own tables. So you will need to create those migrations and models inside of the engine, and then let the engine install those migrations onto the application. It's like when you run the generator for a device. You run device, install it, and then it like, cop copies some migrations onto your app. That's a lot. That's way too much. I, I, I cannot deal with all of that complexity. They're amazing. Don't get me wrong. Rails engines have enabled an amazing progress in the community. But they're just not what I was looking for. They're too complex. Um, so it felt like instead of compressing all of these concepts, it felt like it was expanding them. I would say these engines are far much, much closer to the right, to the microservice experience. They're not deployed on a different server but it almost feels as if they were. I'm looking for something closer to the left, something that still feels small and familiar, but that gives me a bit more control over the growth of my apps. In my research, I kept coming back to Shopify and their articles on decomposing the monolith. And they said, and I quote, while we started, with, started out with a lot of custom code, our components evolved to look more and more like Rails engines. We are doubling down on engines going forward. They are the one modularity mechanism that comes with Rails out of the box. They have the familiar looks and feels of Rails applications, but other than apps, we can run multiple engines in the same process. And we should make decision to extract a component from the and should we make a decision to extract a component from the monolith, an engine is easily transformed into a standalone application. They were talking about this gap, that engines can still be used to fill this gap. So what did they know that we didn't? Were they maintaining those 80 plus files per domain slice and becoming experts at maintaining this kind of complexity? I don't think so. It's, it's way too much. So I did what every motivated engineer would do. I started stalking people. 
I followed everyone everywhere in every social media app on GitHub. I start every repo. I did I did it all <laughs> until the final clue came my way through a notification on GitHub. Raphael from the Rails core team published a one commit repository called Lego. The commit message reads, prepare a componentized application. And the readme says it's created using the engines generator, but removing a few files. So I started removing, uh, remo removing files on an engine of my own in order to find the leanest engine. So I did it. I ran the generator, the generator again and started removing stuff following Raphael's readme. And it worked, but I wanted to keep going. How much more stuff can I remove? So I removed the gem file, the bin folder. I removed the gem spec. I removed the database folder, the test folder, the app folder, the config folder. I removed everything. <laughs> and it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I was missing something critical. A traditional engine is loaded as any gem would be in your gem file. But if you remove the gem spec, how is Rails supposed to know, to know how to load your code? I was stuck. If I wanted to create not just the smallest engine, but the most approachable, the one that felt like code created by myself, code that I owned and completely understood, I had to come up with a way to load it. So I dove into the code base for engines themselves in the Rails code base, and I found a comment that's not on the Rails guide, it's on the documentation for the class. But it was a key to unlock all of the, possible, uh, all of the possibilities in engines. I'm going to read it to you with a few edits of my own. The Rails engine class allows you to wrap a subset of functionality within a larger packaged application. Every Rails application is a Rails engine, which allows for simple feature and application sharing. Uh, specify an engine somewhere inside your lib folder. <coughs> then ensure that this file is loaded at the top of your config uh, application.rb file, and it will. Drum roll, please. Automatically load models, controllers, helpers inside app, load routes at config routes, load locales at config locales, and load tasks at lib tasks. Seen like this, the engine class, it's just a code loading assistant. It can be so much simpler, no 80 files, just one file, and you have an engine. You have a way to load your code. Um, in, and the, the, the important part of this is that it'll know all of the conventions that you already have learned for years when using Rails. So what does this look in practice? Before we start in, an, in our brand new Rails app, we'll create a folder, folder at the root, root of the Rails app where all of, of our engines will live. Call it engines, components, packages, the name really doesn't matter. Whatever you feel conveys the message better in your application. I'll stick to packages, and you'll, you'll know why later in the talk. Now, creating an engine requires to follow a few simple conventions. You first need to create a folder for your engine. It can have actually any name, but I'll call it billing. Inside, create a lib folder and an app folder. Then, inside of the lib folder, create a file called engine. In it, create a class named engine with the building namespace and have it inherit from Rails colon colon engine. Now, to let the application know about this engine, you'll need to require it, just like the, like the docs for engine said. And that's it. Now you can add anything within the app folder of this new engine, and it'll be loaded as any code in your Rails application would. If you run the Rails console, you'll see that the building module is defined and that a build model that you created inside of app models is also there. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to feel the smell of fresh cookies again. I was so excited when I found this. I remembered all of the code bases I had worked on before that would have benefited from this very, very simple technique. We finally found a way to go from this to this. The smallest possible step from a traditional Rails app, but with a huge gain. So what kinds of things can you actually do with this? Let's see a few examples. Let's create a brand new app all over again, Music Universe. Um, before I continue, let's agree on what's about to happen. Your Rails app continues to work 
almost exactly as any Rails app you have worked on in the past. It is still one Rails application, split up, yes, but essentially a single Rails app. That means a single application RB, a single database YML file, the, sim the same sim uh, simple three environments that you have in a vanilla Rails installation, a single da database, it's all the basic stuff. With that out of the way, we'll completely delete the app folder in our Rails app. That's weird, right? The app folder in a traditional Rails app is what holds our domain code, not our configuration code. But our domain code will now be split into different engines or different packages. So we really don't need a single app for it. We'll have many, one inside each engine. So let's plan the structure of this app. We will want to have a teacher app, a student app, and maybe an admin for ourselves. We then follow the steps just, we just went to to create these engines and require them in the application RB file. Now, each app can have its, its own models and controllers and views and even tests and factories. But what happens, for example, when the teacher app gets way too big and you find that it has a few concrete areas that you can actually extract as well? Well, you can have actually engines within engines if you want. In this case, I'm using the word features to encapsulate all of the new packages or engines within the teacher app. You can call it whatever you want. Again, it's, it's not a prescripted thing. So when I pitched this to a few friends, they didn't like it because of the amount of, folder, of folders this created. Not just the nested engines, but the regular ones as well. It, it created like a, this huge chain of folders. And for a moment, I was discouraged because I thought, yeah, they're kind of right. Like, why do you need so many folders? I see the problem, but then I realized I was trading a good architectural mechanism for a UX concern, and UX I can fix. So I actually found a solution for it. In a few IDEs and code editors, you can actually create custom views or workspaces and turn on settings to compact folders so that they take up less space. So you'll go from this to this. So then each of your different modules feels like a very small Rails app. I'm not saying this is the absolute best way to start an app. Knowing which parts of your app to extract into a separate unit is the hardest problem, and you will only know how to do it when you have enough domain knowledge to do so. So take all of this with a grain of salt. But knowing that it is possible and that you don't need any new tools or any new gems to do it is just fascinating to me. OK, so we've covered what the leanest engine looks like. And we put a few classes here and there, but there's many more small details that you need to know about when you're actually doing this in a real application. I'll go into some of these, but uh, I won't be able to cover everything. So model time migrations. I mentioned before that we wouldn't use migrations from an engine in a traditional sense, in the way that you have migrations inside the engine and then you copy them through to the application. Remember, we're treating this app as if it were a normal Rails application, just with a different structure for our domain code. Instead of using the normal Rails model generator, first, we'll create the model file. This will give us an, uh, an idea of what the table name will be. In this case, it'll be teacher app teachers for a teacher model inside of a teacher app engine. And then you just run the migration generator to create the table you want. Remember, we are splitting our domain code, not stuff like database configura or configuration. Those with a keen eye will have noticed that the teacher class now inherits from application record, but we actually deleted the app folder where that class lived. You might say this won't work, and you're right, it doesn't. <laughs> I deleted the app folder for the ultimate dramatic effect, but we do need a place to define all of these core classes, but we can create an engine for that. So I'll create a package named core, just like we did with the others, and create all of my classes like application record or application controller. But if you take a look at this app structure, there's something a little bit odd about it. I don't know if you notice it. I'm naming, I'm naming the package core or the engine core, but I'm not using the core module to namespace my, cl my classes. Remember, SideWork will load all of the code on their app, even inside of engines. So in any engine, you can define a class at the top level module. 
and it'll just work. It's a sharp knife, but we like sharp knives. That's why we can have an engine uh, to organize our core classes, but not have core become a namespace. With that out of the way, just run the Rails migration, and everything works like a charm. Testing. For me, one of the biggest benefits is to have my tests located alongside the code that they're meant to test. And in this case, uh, there's a little caveat. When you create a new Rails engine, it'll create its own test helper. We deleted that, or we didn't even create it when creating these engines. So we'll just use the test helper from our Rails app, the one that comes installed by default. To run tests for all packages, you just run bin Rails test packages with the trailing slash. Or if you want to test a single package, you can run test packages slash teacher app. Remember, packages, engines, components, choose the name that conveys it better for you. And also, you can use factories. If you use factory bots, you can configure factories per engine. If your engine has controllers, it'll manage routes. And the good news is that routes will work as they always have. You'll have the regular routes at config slash routes, and the engine will have its own routes. You'll have to configure your engine's routes in the routes file for the engine. And then you'll just mount the engine in the application's routes. So then you'll have a single route folder that will mount all of your different engines. When you have nested engines as well, you can mount in the engine's nested route folder as well. It becomes a bit complex, yes, but it's totally possible. And you can use constraint as well. So you could actually serve your, um, your new engine from a subdomain if you wanted, or you could constrain it by IP. So you could have maybe different resources or server clusters per engine. You have to talk to your local DevOps expert to figure it out. And one thing that I find out as well is that you can use uh, this new gem that's called Cypress to build your, uh, a static uh, web page from within Rails. So you could have your marketing site, your blog, and your app split them in different engines if you wanted from a single Rails application. There's a bunch of other stuff that I won't be able to go through, like different types of configurations you can add to your engine, initializers, assets, but paths are pre-configured, so they kind of just work out of the box, and a lot more. But I want to make a pause here. Some of you might think, well, there's really not much difference between the traditional app folder with modules, namespacing classes. And you're kind of right. Technically, it's, it's not very different. You can do the exact same thing in, with, a single Rails, uh, with a single app folder and just modules. But the story that this, that this structure tells is very different. We have, we have put plates for push and handles for pull in our code base. What I mean by that is that having this separation will signal that classes have concrete, a complete, uh, sorry, have a concrete and have a concrete home, uh, completely separated from other homes within your app. It conveys that they are meant to be used in a particular way. These new homes will naturally expand within its bounds and will seek protection from external forces. With very little friction, you can start thinking of your app as a collection of very simple pieces. I recently rewatched this 2012 talk by Rich Hickey, Simplicity Matters, where he talks about developing sensibilities around, en around entanglement in order to create simple code. He calls simplicity the primary source of true agility because it enables change. Rich says, we can choose to solve problems in simple or complex ways. Simple meaning one fold or one braid, like a single piece of thread, versus complex, which means to weave or braid many things together. Imagine that drawer that you have at home with like full of tangled USB cables, where you can just pull one because you'll pull the whole ball of cables uh, out of it. So in the context of this talk, what does simple and complex mean? So we have tools to create this, something that resembles the familiar structure of a Rails app, which has a few or a lot of classes that interact with each other. And we are now free to create as many of these as we want, but they will need to communicate with each other. If we're not careful about keeping this communication in check, we'll end up making a mess. Some of you might have noticed that we already started making those connections when we 
use the application record class from within the teacher app engine. Every active record model in our whole application will probably need to have this dependency. I think this is where Rails frictionless process for creating code sometimes works against us. It's so fast to create things that we sometimes don't stop and ask about the ownership of classes in complex domains like this one. But knowing who the owner is and who is meant to have access to a class is a very important question to create simple systems, not ones that are braided in complicated ways. This talk is called All You Need Is Rails Engines, yes. But because all the, all the classes, modules, and constants in all of our engines are auto-loaded and available everywhere, it's hard to guard against the indiscriminate use of classes all around. That's why engines love Backwork. Backwork is a gem by Shopify, which helps maintain healthy relationships between different parts of your domain. It does so by, by helping you make conscious and intentional decisions on when to take on a new dependency and encourages, to, encourages you to design a proper, proper public API. You'll need to add the Packwork gem to your gem file and then create the Packwork bin stub. Then run a bin Packwork in it let, we'll let you create all the necessary files for Packwork to work. <coughs> this gem works by defining packages. That's why I've been using engines and packages indistinguishably in this talk. Uh, interchangeably, sorry. A package is just a collection of code within, our folder, with, uh, within a folder. In our case, the engine folder. We make every engine in the Music Universe app a package by creating a package YML file in it. Now that we know how to make our, make our lean engines turn into packages, um, sorry, no, we, now, we now know how to make our engines packages. And we have to understand a couple of concepts that, pack, that Packwork has. The first one is privacy. I like to think of privacy in packages as privacy in Ruby classes. You define a public interface for your class so other classes can call methods on it, but inside it, you'll have many private methods that are used by the class but are not accessible to the outside world. Privacy in packages is the same thing, but not at the method level, but at the folder level. Packwork makes most of its code, most of the code inside your package private and draws a strong boundary so you can call classes and constants and modules from within the package without the, break, without the fear of breaking anything outside it. To provide others with your package's functionality, you'll need to make some of that code public. So you'll open your package to the world, but only through specific classes and modules that you define as public. In your package, everything will be private, except for anything under the app slash public folder. You can customize this if you want, but this is the default that it comes with. I like to think of the public interface of a package as the interface for any gem that wraps an API. For example, I've been working with the OctoKit gem lately. That's the official Ruby gem for the GitHub API. And it looks a little bit like this. You have our engine's uh, module. In this case, it's the OctoKit name. And then you can have any class, in this case, client, which is the interface class. In it, you have methods that will call private classes and methods and any other stuff that's private to the package. So in that sense, the API is like our private code inside of the package. In the case of our Music Universe app, a hypothetical public interface for the teacher's app's building package might look something like this. So we talked about privacy. The second concept is dependency. Packwork requires you to be very specific, to be intentional about the relationships between packages. If you know a package depends on each other, you need to declare it explicitly. For example, the teacher app package depends on the core package because it uses the application record class. The student app package also depends on the core package so because they use also the application record class. So how do you know when you set all of this up if you're doing things right? So Packwork has the concept of violations. And there are different types of violations that you can commit that you'll need to fix in order for your application to be healthy. The first one is this one. In this case, the teacher app from inside uh, a private class, it's calling another private class inside of the core package. That creates two violations. First, a privacy violation, because it's reaching for code inside of the private 
section of the core package, but also dependency because I'm not telling it to explicitly uh, depend on the core package. On the other hand, if the teacher app from a private class reaches onto the public uh, interface of the core app, of the core app package, that's okay because it's using the private interface, the, the public interface, but it's not declaring its dependency uh, to the core package. So you need to be intentional about that. What about if you actually declare that dependency but reach into the core package and use private classes? You, you'll still be in violation because you're not using the public API. So in Packwork, a healthy relationship is one where you declare the dependency on the package and always use its public API. When you run Packwork check without any violations, it'll just show you that no offenses were detected. So that means that your code base, the relationships in your code base are healthy. You can run this in a pre-commit hook or in CI, or there's even a VS Code plugin so that you can get instant feedback as you code. The docs for, from, from Packwork are very thorough, and I really uh, suggest you go read them because they're really good. And there's also a talk, a really good talk from Alex Evanchik called Laying the Cultural and Technical, Technical Foundations for Big Rails. Uh, I really, really recommend that. So engines acting as a very simple code loading assistant for our modularized architecture plus Packwork to help us keep things neatly organized is the last piece that I'm gonna talk about in this um, architecture spectrum. By doing this, any package is a very few steps away from becoming a microservice if you reach the point where it no longer sense, makes sense to keep it in your monolith. The, reason, the reasons to extract something become less and less about code quality and entanglement, and they become more about operational constraints. I personally feel so much better now knowing that there is a path, that there are techniques that and that they are, for the most part, already part of Rails, or designed to work very closely with the framework and its conventions. So try it out, get a feel for it, extract some stuff, read the docs. I envision a future where this is no longer a niche technique of large-scale Rails organizations like Shopify, but a common architectural pattern in Rails. I would love to, to see generators that build engines for you, or to see scaffolding work, not just for a regular app, but for folders within our lean engines. I would love for gem authors to think outside the box and create or update their gems to work in alternative ways of structuring our code. I would also love to see examples uh, from a single Rails app being served by multiple different uh, clusters of servers, of servers, each with its own different resources. And I would love for all of you to try this all out and write about it and make videos and get people to try it. I hope these tools reignite your passion for writing beautiful code and beautiful systems that are a joy to work in, regardless of their scale. Thank you. <laughs>